Hi, Fred. How are you? How are you, Fred? I'm good. I, I had trouble getting my microphone working, but <laughs> seems to be working now, I think. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. How about you? Good. I'm excellent. Thank you so much. You've uh, you've been to a couple of our meetings, right, Fred? I remember, maybe one, or this is your first time. No, I've been to one before. Okay, good. Which one did you come to? Uh, it was about the Chinese and the Silk Road. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. That was me presenting again. Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Hello. Let me people as I come. One second. There's Ralph. Huh. Let me just announce that we're here and we're live. Hi, Ralph. Ralph knows a lot about the uh, <laughs> um, this stuff, the chemical reaction. That's the awesome help. How are you? Hey, Zach, how are you doing? Good, 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 excellent, excellent. Weather is kind of terrible, but otherwise feeling good. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to announce where the people are. You know, Mikhail said he can't come today, but the others, supposed to be 15, 16 people. Uh-huh, okay, slow to show up. I know, we usually get pretty quickly, right? Yeah. If not, I mean, we'll, we'll just move it, I guess. I mean, there should be more people now coming. I guess I did a bad, um, which might call it, advertisement. <laughs> of well, the it was posted in the usual way. Couldn't be any problem. <clears throat> yeah, weather shouldn't be an obstacle for this. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody has to go anywhere. We'll give it a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Here's more people coming in. Craig. Hi, Craig. Marika. Okay, so it's the same people. I mean, we're going to post it. I guess it's going to be more like a discussion, I guess. Hi, <laughs> Sack. Hi, Marika. All right. More people coming. One second. Let me just get some water.
<sighs> Let me see what's happening. You sick Morgan. How's everybody doing? Greg, good. Murray. good. Hi. There was um, I saw there's a philo philosophy discussion recently uh, was posted. I didn't get a chance to get into it. They were talking about history. There's a philosophical group that talk, talked about the um, how was it to live in medieval times, I guess, during the Dark Ages. I am. It looked interesting. Okay, which which one? I'm I'm member of so many groups. I usually <laughs> get all this. I'll tell you. Yeah, I saw the email notice about that. It was on, uh, I guess it was a series of them taking one type of person at a time, a farmer, an artisan, a knight, and so on, and exploring ah. just the daily life of various types of individuals. That's what I understand. I haven't seen it. But so, I think somebody saw one of them and said it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm part of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex is here. How are you? Hi. Hi. So, hi. what's the name of it? Uh, uh, I can send it to you. I'll, I'll text you. All right. It's, it's a philosoph philosophy discussions. Uh, yeah. He has like over three thousand members or something. Yeah, there are some groups that I went through. Yeah, they. They're discussing some history books. I mean, yeah, sometimes, yeah, there are some other interesting groups. So you're saying this group is not interesting? <laughs> no, this so is we're not the one. only one. Uh, <laughs> no, no, this is number one. The other ones, uh, somewhat, I guess, sometimes, occasionally. <laughs> you know, so guys, just to give you an update, I got my second shot today. So, oh, very good. Good. so all right, yesterday, sorry, not today. Oh, yeah. so you're feeling okay today? I don't know. Well, we'll see. <laughs> oh, if you got it yesterday and today, you should be fine. Yeah. It's usually within 24 hours. Yeah. I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't have any problems the second day. I, yeah. Okay, good. Yep. So we have 11 people on. Um... I want to start, uh, if you guys don't mind, and I'm not meeting sure. the con. Yeah, yeah, it's seven minutes, sure. Sure. So today we're talking about history of gun power. Obviously, you can't mention history of gun power without talking about guns, right? So it's going to be a combination of both. So let's just talk about, uh, God, as usual. All right. So first, we want to talk about the uses of gun power. You know, before we get the uh, composition of it and stuff. You know, firearms. Obviously, we know that um, you know combination of you know three different um, chemicals. You know, uh, uh, make make up you know potentially gun power. Special effects. You know, explosives, fireworks. You know, fuses. You know, medicine. That's interesting. Uh, and you know, I'll get to it. But apparently, pharmaceuticals use a lot of the um, uh, things that were developed for gun power, farming, you know, obviously, you got to kill those crows. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. Discovery. Before I get to the discovery, let me just um, throw a quote by you. It's written by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology will appear as magic. So obviously, you know, and before I'm going to talk about discovery, as we remember Jean d'Arc, um, you know, one of the reasons that John de Arc they thought of her as a witch is because um, apparently, uh, as a peasant, she was able to look. I mean, particularly in 1431, um, she was actually uh, working a lot with uh, people, the gun makers, and was trying to figure out how the guns work. And apparently, in those times, that uh, for a person to discover uh, the cannons and the guns, at the point she mastered it. And so um, apparently uh, English wrote about her saying that she acted so wisely and clearly in waging war as if she was a captain who had experience of 20, 20 or 30 years, and especially in the setting up of alt uh, artillery. 
for it, uh, for that, she helped herself magnific magnificent, magnificently. As we know, uh, going basically forward, um, you know, she was uh, proclaimed to be a witch, but apparently she was the, you know, she helped France to defeat English through using the farm arms because she spent a lot of time with craftsmen and figured out how to use cannon and all that other stuff. So, um, so they say subsequently, if, you know, uh, John was so effective, surprising in battle, um, you know, it was quite easy, you know, when during the, the fight that, um, uh, that, you know, English proclaimed her to be a witch because of her um, devilry using the gunpowder in cannons. All right, so where does where is the gunpowder was developed? It was developed in, you know, China initially. So uh, what is a gunpowder? You know, and then we'll get to the, how it got. Gunpowder is a blend of sulfur, charcoal, or salt pepper, right? Uh, salt peter, sorry. The substance of uh, finally crashed, mixed together, as so particles of um, each are always touching one another. When gunpowder is set on fire, the sulfur burns first because it had low ignition temperature, 261 uh, centigrade. Sulfur ignites the charcoal, a hot, clean fuel. The burning mix quickly reaches 335 centigrade, which is the ignition point of a salt pep, saltpeter. Uh, what is the saltpeter? Saltpeter is a nitrate salt. Today's typically potassium nitrate. Um, when the saltpeter ignites, the nitrate radically releases extra oxygen, which dramatically speeds up the combustion of the sulfur charcoal, okay? Combustion now produces hot gases, which goes in every direction, causes the bullet, which, you know, bullet in a barrel, to speed up in, in gun barrel or a bomb to fly. So gunpowder was developed in China. Um, so it was developed around ninth century by Chinese alchemists. Unlike our European alchemists, as you know, there are European alchemists that were called, you know, um, you know, uh, seeking philosopher's stone, which is they were looking for a stone that converts your know, regular um, metal or regular uh, matter into gold. The Chinese actually were looking for elixir uh, for light uh, to to uh, for the to live indefinitely, basically, and and uh, they were looking for fountain of youth, basically. And they came stumble across this particular um, three uh, particles. So, so Chinese counterparts, inspired by Taoism, all right, were looking for an elixir of life, hoping that they could come up with something that would allow them to live forever. In that search, Chinese alchemists had identified saltpeter and sulfur as interesting ingredients and seemed to have tried a variety of combinations in search of the magic elixir. Saltpeter is a white powder that is formed by bacteria in topsoil. And now let me show you what it looks like. So this is, this is what saltpeter looks like. Saltpeter looks like. Um, so it's, it's a white powder that, uh, that's form, uh, formed by bacteria in topsoil uh, um, as, they, um, as they feast on the decaying organic matter. It often appears as white, white particles, which I'm showing, and in the warm, humid climate of southern China, these particles are leached by water in a surface, which they can be harvested. So you can see this is not an easy type of particle to obtain. There is a number of things that need to happen. You know, bacteria needs to be developed and needs to be basically pushed up by water. Uh, in fact, when Arabs learned the gunpowder from Chinese, they called saltpeter as a Chinese snow. It looks exactly like a snow. Um, so, anybody has any questions or wanted to add anything? Um, let me know. If not, I'll just move on. Uh, let me see if anybody I need to add. No, okay. Uh, just, just a couple of points. I think there are two sources of salt, Peter. Uh, I, I, sort of, you sort of mentioned them both, but one is sort of through a natural uh, water leaching process, which produces uh, deposits of white apparently mineral saltpeter, but you can also manufacture it from by taking, what is it, horse manure and urine or something of that sort, and then yeah, leaching okay, that. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, you can, produce, you can find it in two different forms, find it or make it. That's exactly right. I, I okay. agree, agree with you, but 
there's an interesting aspect to it. <laughs> yeah. And very funny aspect, in fact. So now um, uh, we've been, we already went through it. Um, so we need 15% of charcoal, 10% of sulfur, 75% of saltpeter, right? So uh, weaponization, all right? Uh, uh, the first weaponization of gunpowder was in the 10th century, which is use of the uh, fire lance, basically. And we'll get to that, we'll explain. So, um, so what happened is, um, uh, well, before we get to that, so how did Chinese uh, were able to discover, alchemists trying to dis discover uh, this uh, combination? So Chinese alchemists, you know, looking to purify uh, this combination, purify saltpeter and sulfur, basically um, often heated them together. Uh, and the very first reference of gunpowder comes from a Chinese text dating from 850 AD and was titled Classified Essentials for the Mysterious Tao of True Origins of Things. So basically it was within the teachings of, you know, uh, of Taoism and this uh, particular writings write the following thing. They say, some have heated together sulfur, real gar and saltpeter with honey. Smoke and flames resulted so that the hands and the faces had burnt and even the whole house where they were working burned down. So they're talking about the people that are messing with this particular substance uh, in 850 and this was happening. Chinese scholars interpreted this interaction of the materials within the philosophical framework of yin and yang, noting the quote. So in China, it was interesting. They always wanted to, uh, what is sulfur related to and what is, you know, uh, saltpeter related to? So they're saying is, they're saying saltpeter is extremely negative and moonish, so therefore it's a yin. Uh, sulfur is extremely positive and sunny, so the four is a yang. So it's a yin-yang relationship. That's how they basically were able to document this in 850. Um, so um, they're saying when the two supernatural elements, yin and yang, meet each other in an excessive closed space, the resulting explosion will stun, avert soul, and shatter everything around it. Okay. So within a century, um, so we're talking about the 10th century now, in the century or so, gunpowder was taken by the Song Dynasty and used to make a flaming arrows and rockets. Uh, let me show you um, the progression of it. So uh, let me just explain, you know, Song Dynasty was uh, prior to, uh, or part of the, um, I'm sorry, prior to uh, Mongols invasion. Um, and therefore, uh, what did it look like? All right. So um, this is how it would look like. Basically what they're saying, the most promising application through use of gunpowder and accelerant to, in the fire lenses, which is what the depiction from the, um, from, uh, the 10th century. So the handheld flamethrower, because this is a bamboo tube, which is you seeing a bamboo tube that can shoot flames for about five minutes or so, okay? Uh, so, so soldiers soon realized that the right mix of salt, pepper, sulfur, and charcoal could be used to just, just to ignite the fire lens, but had to explosive power needed to propel bits of metal um, or pot shells that would uh, injure the enemy. This resulted in what we call today a mortar. So they, in China, after using those lenses, they decided they wanted to use a mortar. And this is how it would look um, if you would go back in China. This is a you know a, um, copy of the original or a good meat replica. So over time, Chinese replaced the bamboo tube with the fire lances. You know, a bamboo tube in the fire lances with a tube of bronze or iron. Okay, and it would look like something like this, right? In the 13th century. So what happened in the 13th century? Um, at the end. You know, as you know, um, the Mongols, you know, Genghis Khan, and subsequently um, his, um, uh, his, his son and his grandson invaded uh, China. And therefore, China was under the uh, dynasty of Mongols. And uh, there was a huge rebellion that happened. And I'll talk about this rebellion. But prior to this rebellion, I just want to explain what was used in the rebellion to repel Mongols and throw them out of Mongolia. 
The Chinese troop replaced the beats of metal with a projectile like a ball. By making a close fit between projectile and the wall of the tube, the force of the explosive of the gunpowder caused the projectile to exit the tube with a great force and high velocity. Um, so if you made the tube longer, it became possible to give projectile a specific trajectory and aim at the target. Now we're talking about you know, rifles and all the other stuff. Through the steps, the Chinese invented the first gun, which is you're looking at it. The first Chinese gun, uh, tentatively dated at 1288, and the Chinese bronze hand, hand, uh, cannon from 1332, and a foot long and weighed eight pounds. It was a foot long and weighed eight pounds. Hundred, uh, hundred of larger cannons have survived from 1350 as well. They used to shoot both stone and iron balls. So at the time they used both stone and iron balls and they realized that iron balls were more useful. Note that guns and cannons barrels need to be carefully formed today. They're usually drilled out. Gun barrel in Chinese times were made by rolling a sheet of metal into a tube, but that could necessar that couldn't necessarily contain the gunpowder blast and frequently blew in a soldier's face. face. As a, as a result, guns and cannons were expensive from the start. As the future of Ming emperors fought and defeated the Mongols in the 14th century, and both sides used cannons in a battle, but the, uh, the Ming dynasty used it better. So now let me just talk about the Ming dynasty. So what happened is, you know, um, you know, Mongols conquer China and, you know, uh, and basically in the beginning of 13th century going to 14th century. And in 1356, we have this peasant, his name is Zhu Yang Zhang, who was the revolutionary leader. And with his wife, whose name is Ma, um, I mean, they were both dirt poor. I mean, he was dirt poor. She was actually a, a daughter of the, uh, um, this warlord. And the third person, uh, um, another, another guy called, you know, Zheng uh, Zhang. Um, so basically he was an ordinary man. And what happened is uh, he, uh, since being an ordinary man, he was hanging around a lot of the peasants and a lot of the craftsmen that developed um, all, all this uh, different ideas about um, on how to develop cannon and handguns and all that stuff. So, um, Apparently, um, uh, when people had nothing to eat during the Mongol times because they'd taken everything from them, this person, uh, Zhu Yang Zheng, comes around and basically develops this universal enthusiasm, uh, you know, uh, to repel the Mongols, and they're using all these cannons to repel them. So, so what happened is um, the Mongols, as you know, they're trained to use bow and arrow. So they don't know how to use these cannons uh, with, with deadly accuracy, right? They're very, they, they have a hordes of them, hordes of them attacking, you know, day and night. And they already kind of in China, they already have a dynasty that developed. And this is predecessor to Ming dynasty. And essentially, uh, Zheng, Zheng Jing becomes the uh, an emperor of the Ming dynasty. But initially he's this poor man. So now uh, what's interesting is, um, uh, Zhao, that's the third man that was uh, was a rebellious of three, which is Zhang Jing, his wife Mao, and Zhao. Zhao actually designs a weapon he called a human thunder, a small stone propelled by an explosive charge, a lethal combination, a future of the warfare be written. So he develops this cannon, basically, to fight Mongols. So Zhao is quick to see potential with this fire weapon. So he's saying, I'll conquer the empire as easily as turning the palm of my hands upside down. Zhao confidently will soon be put in a test that gets the deadliest, deadliest Mongols. So now they're expecting Mongols to attack and they're already under, uh, you know, Genghis Khan, um, you know, uh, Genghis Khan uh, conquest, Genghis Khan, um, I'm sorry, uh, was there 150 years prior to that as his sons are uh, now in charge of China. And so what's interesting is um, this guy, uh, Zhang Zheng, who is the uh, future emperor of China now wants to cause his rebellion red turbans. And they're trying to conquer a city of Na Nanjing. Nanjing right now is Beijing. 
And uh, basically, he only has peasant army. He can't get the uh, you know bureaucracy to side with him. So he's going out there against Mongols with all this army and this development by his friend Zhao of this cannon. Uh, so the key to his strategy uh, was a weapon that you know that changed mankind: the gun. But the gun are the crude design; it can be aimed properly. All right. Let me just show you how the Zhang Jing looks. Um, That's, that's his picture. He's the future emperor of China, the Ming Dynasty. So the key to his strategy, um, so, but the gun are a crude design and can be uh, aimed properly. So he comes, comes up with this gun, but you can't aim properly. So it doesn't really work well. So the, you know, the problem of the early firearms is having, you know, pellets leave gun and go into the direction you want, you know, you want them to go, but the aim was the issue. Right? They were aiming at people, it wasn't going where it needs to go. So the gun maker Zhao solution was, well, let's do um, qual quantity over quality. Let's create a hail of storm of bullets uh, that would you know, basically stun and, um, and kill as many Mongols as we can. Because they were dealing with a large hordes of attackers, rockets and fire lenses proved to be very effective weapons. They were light, cheap, and could be launched uh, against a horde is to create both injury and confusion. Now, if you think of it, the whole defense you have to change, everything you have to change, because now you don't deal with, um, you know, bow and arrow, you're dealing with actually, uh, um, you know, early version of cannon, early version of gun and lances. Uh, so the aliyah, the, the enemy, we must wait um, till right moment. The fire must be intense. That's what his quote was. A hundred former I mean, 104 forearms make a difference. So you basically armed as many people as you could and they shot in quantity versus quality. They weren't aiming. Um, so basically it shattered the whole old school defensive technology and stunned Mongols or threw them out. And then they finished the Great Wall and he became an emperor basically. And um, uh, so this is what happened. Okay, anybody has any questions? No. Uh, did I lose a lot of people already? <laughs> um, just, I, I guess, a couple of, of brief comments. Well, actually, Nanjing is not Beijing. Nanjing means southern capital. Beijing means northern capital. So Nanjing or Nanking, as it was also called, is uh, well south of Beijing. Um, secondly, as you say, because they couldn't be aimed, uh, guns were very were pretty well useless for one on one at a distance. So uh, they were much more effective if you had if you were confronting a large troop, a large battle line. Then uh, if you fired your gun, if it went up or down, it would be lost. But if it went sideways, it would still hit somebody. So guns were often used in arrays of guns firing against a line of attackers, which made them, which made accuracy less important. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions there? Uh, and I appreciate that about Nanjing. Nanjing you know, not familiar as much about the uh, uh, Chinese history. So now, uh, how does this uh, particular uh, technology get into the uh, Europe, right? We're talking about Silk Road, right? So before we uh, get to actually how we got to the Silk Road, the first mention of, uh, uh, of a gun or the, uh, the gunpowder was actually um, uh, mentioned by the um, a monk uh, to um, uh, the Pope uh, at the time in 13th, in 13th century. And um, basically this is what he said Oops, sorry. By the flashing combustion of the fires and by the arrow of the sound, wonders can be uh, wrought um, at any distance that we wish so that the man can hardly protect himself or endure it. Observation of the calm power that was written to Pope in around um, by Roger Bacon, who was the English natural philosopher on 12, 1267. Uh, and that was his observation, basically. 
uh, what's also interesting how it got to the uh, uh, to Europe. First is the Silk Road, right? Silk Road was a trade that went all the way through, um, you know, uh, Tarim Basin all the way through uh, Asia Minor and um, you know to Europe. But also, you remember, uh, Mongols invaded Russia and Eastern Europe and could have also used some of this technology during their invasion. As you know, Mongols were in 13th century. And um, since they don't, they didn't think of Chinese as worth, you know, uh, as, I mean, they thought of Chinese as worthless. They put in a European and Arab, um, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, um, the, the people that they conquered uh, who were Arab and Europeans as part of the, um, their um, governors in different areas. And therefore, um, since those, those guys were there in you know, Europe and, you know, and um, in Arab lands, they were actually seeing all this technology being close to China. So, so what's interesting is, um, this is how I think, we think it's it gotten to Europe. Uh, Zach? Huh? Yeah, a bit of a comment on that. As you say, nobody really knows. There's no good evidence for exactly the route. There are actually three possible routes. One is by the Arabs, uh, the Muslims, but there, there's almost no evidence. And the fact that Francis Bacon was gave the recipe in twelve in the late 1200s, um, that was pretty early. So it couldn't really have diffused westward through the Arabs. And there's no trace of it in the Arab Muslim world at this time. The Mongols, of course, were coming across at this time and they had encountered gunpowder in China. A third possibility is actually Francis Bacon had a friend and, and colleague who was, the, um, who was an ambassador to China. He had individually traveled to China and come back. And that's sort of another possibility. It was sort of a direct personal contact between Francis Bacon and uh, the, the empire of China. Okay, so yeah, but nobody, nobody knows for sure, but there are several possibilities. Thanks. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so, uh, and what's interesting is once it got to Europe, it took about 50 years for, um, from the, you know, the, the academic and, you know, uh, side to transfer it into the um, into the field of you know uh, for the army and soldiers. So it basically took them about fifty years. So in about by 1330, military commanders were adding cannons and gunpowder to their arsenal throughout Europe. Okay, so um, it's, that's basically it. And here I'm you know mentioning those areas. And if you can if you can see this is a you know kind of like progression or evolution of uh, canon and we'll get we'll get through it as well. And again, if you have any questions or want to add anything, let me know. So the first mention or the first use of cannons was actually, uh, was used by Edward III of England uh, in the Battle of Cressy uh, in 1346. And I mean, obviously who does English always fight? French. So, um, uh, it wasn't used not so much to mow down the French knights who actually had an incredible armor, but for that, he relied on his longbow archers, not for the cannons, as to terrorize the French. That's, he was only using it to scare them with the thunderous sounds of his cannon and the fire that spewed from their barrels. So he just basically used it as the uh, shock and all type of... <laughs> weapon, it wasn't doing anything except for that purpose. Um, so what's interesting is, so it got to Europe, but the climate in Europe was kind of not the same climate as in China, right? You have more humid and it's hot in China and in Europe, they don't have something like that. So early on collecting enough saltpeter, which actually developed more in humid and hot climates was a serious, problem in Europe because the climate was not so sufficiently hot and humid for the sort of rapid natural production that we saw in China. While some gunpowder makes, um, you, know, you know, corn barnyards, previews and cavens looked for the telltale while droppings, others experimenting with recreating natural condition. One recipe 
from 1561 recommends filling a pit with an old plaster, horse dung, human feces, and urine. And I quote about the urine, namely the urine of the person which drink either the wine or the beer. So as Ralph had mentioned, it was a horse. <laughs> it was close enough, but basically they were saying, if you take a human, um, especially somebody who is drunk, what does it develop? It develops ammonium. So ammonium could be used uh, as as a you know as an alternative to saltpeter. So uh, it would be it would be more efficient to get a horse drunk, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that could be. It could be. Um, I guess Rama has a couple of questions. Rama, you want to add anything or? No, okay. So basically, that was, you know, that was the, um, that was the thing. So what is, how does, you know, Europe uses, you know, uses, uses mostly gunpowder mainly as weapons from the start. First cannon emerged less than a century after the uh, idea arrived and was first used during the Hundred Year War. There's also, which I mentioned, there's also a belief that it was used during the siege of Constantinople by Ottomans. As you remember, Mehmed II um, invited a Hungarian craftsman to build, uh, I believe the name of the uh, cannon was Sophia. And um, it, it was an incredible, uh, I think there was three cannons. And the only scare was from the car craftsmen when um, they were bombing Constantinople is would this particular, um, you know, uh, barrel would it, would explode itself instead of you know, uh, and obviously you have to realize how many rounds can you do? Uh, it was it was very hard to know. So, um, yeah, you, had... you know, Zach. Uh, I, by the way, I, I think they only did just a few rounds uh, you know, from the big uh, uh, cannon. Uh, and it did explode, actually, and killed a lot of people. But uh, I, it did damage the wall, uh, the walls, uh, apparently. So it, it did play a role in taking Constantinople. So let me just uh, talk a little bit about, I just mentioned, um, how does urine and alcoholic human being? Uh, so it, we didn't know at the time, but metabolism of alcohol in the urine produces ammonium a favorite food for nitrate bacteria. So that's basically what I just mentioned. Uh, because of the major military ch challenges in Europe were either to break down the walls of castles or attack the you know, walls of towns or sink a naval ship, as opposed to stopping the invading hordes, European used gunpowder mostly in the form of cannon. But to do as they had to fashion stronger and larger cannons, so in China, they were small, like puny. And in, um, and in Europe, they're big. Casting large pieces like cannon is difficult and expensive because you had to pour the molten metal carefully to avoid creating any big air bubbles. Those are known as rat holes. And rat holes can be weakened at casting once it cools. If for, uh, for the reason the art of the casting came to be known as being more dependent on a fortune than the ability. As Greg had mentioned, the cannons exploded when they attacked Constantinople. It was more a fortune than the ability. It was incredible machine, but it was, you know, it's good luck basically. To avoid, cast, to avoid, to avoid casting and its related uh, problem, cannon makers tried boring techniques from um, uh, coopers or barrel, barrel makers, cannon makers basically. Um, so they thought that um, what, what we need to do to, um, to make uh, this particular, you know, cannon more sustainable instead of, you know, it's been exploding in our faces. Cannon makers would place long rod iron rods around the wooden core and hit them, hit them and iron and iron them together. Then they would fill any cracks with a white lead and add white rings of iron, which would shrink um, when they cooled and hold everything together once the wooden core was pulled out. Uh, now you can see why we talk about cannons and guns as having a barrel. 
So this process was very involved. And I've just explained to you, uh, which reading it, it, it was basically, uh, they inserted a wooden um, log inside and they put the rings around it and they cool, they hit it up and they pulled the log out. And that's how they were able to get that particular cannon uh, without any rat holes. Um, uh, but it took a long time for cannons to fire as Greg had mentioned. You can, you know, in fact, at the siege of Metz during the 100 year war, gunners were surprised if they fired three rounds a, a day. So you're at a siege, you're trying to break the walls and you can fire this three rounds, that's all. One of the challenges confront, uh, con, conf, uh, con, confronting gunners was the gunpowder often got damped and spoiled quickly. So the gunpowder was not good um, because the salt pepper, everything was just spoiled. To overcome this problem, powder makers learned to add a small amount of liquid to the three basic ingredients before grinding them together in a mortar and pestle. Again, human urine was a preferred liquid to be added. And it was thought that the urine of uh, in, imbibing bishops <laughs> made especially good gunpowder, sorry. Powder makers then shaped the resulting paste known as milk cake into the corn or uh, granules. And then it was uh, allowed to dry. They most likely called the granules corn since they uh, looked like the wheat grain. So basically now we're using corn in order to uh, kind of like um, make this whole process solid. Um, not, not only did it work better, but because it had a reduced surface area, it was less prone to absorb moisture. And the gunners also found it was powerful and easier to load into the guns. Whereas a cannon might have needed 34 pounds of, you know, to shoot and 50, 47 pound stone ball. It only took 18 pounds of a new corn powder to fire the same ball at the same distance. The main advantage of the corning, as they call it, is that all the granules ignited when the gunpowder is lit and more hot gas created more quickly, hot gas created quickly. Without corning, much of the powder was often wasted, but it blew out of the barrel before it burned. So saltpeter was not useful at all. Climate, because of the fact that it was getting spoiled. So they used corn uh, to kind of hold this whole thing together. Let me... Uh, I just... Uh... I, I'm a little confused by that last sentence. I mean, they were still using saltpeter, 75% potassium nitrate. Uh, what was it? 10% car, 15% uh, carbon, and 10% sulfur. That was the ideal uh, mixture for an explosive gunpowder. Right. Uh, and it took people a while because if you if you have the proportions wrong, you'll get a lot of flame and smoke, but you won't get an optimum explosion. Um, the corning, of course, is just the name for the granular gunpowder. It's just the form that the gunpowder takes. It's still the same uh, gunpowder. Correct. It's, a, it's, it's basically they put it in a, in a form where they could shoot it. It wouldn't leak out or it won't get spoiled. But at the same time, it, you know, it, it kind of formed it together. It was a, an overall form. In fact, they actually use um, uh, granulating in a pharmaceutical industry, uh, this particular uh, fact when they when you know they put together the pills so um well so what's interesting is um <clears throat> we have now we developed the cannons but now cannons became the system of interconnected components right uh better powder which was corning provoked a need for a stronger cannon and gun makers started the production of a bronze Church bells, okay? They thought, well, let's look at the church bells. Let's see what they do differently. Like, like cannon barrels, bells have to be, ha have to be cast around the uh, hollow core. Around this time, it also became possible to cast iron to make cannon, uh, thanks to the development of, of the blast furnace. So when the blast furnace was developed, they decided to cast the cannons and it was much better 
uh, way of doing it. Up to the uh, early modern Europeans could not build a fire hot enough to melt iron. Cast iron only became widely available when iron, you know, iron masters learned to pump a blast of air into a furnace loaded with an iron ore and charcoal. Let me just see if I have this picture here. Sorry, I don't have the picture, but we'll get to that. So now, um, <clears throat> uh, while it was good, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, as gun makers became more proficient at casting uh, cannon barrels, they learned how much metal they needed in different parts of the cannon. So we can apply different metals in different parts to make it even a bigger blast. While it was good to have as much as eight inches iron at the breach, the back of the barrel, the pressure of the explosion of the gunpowder decreased even a few inches forward as um, so that by the point you can get away with only two or three inches of thickness. Gun makers also realize if, they, if you make a barrel longer uh, relative to the bore, then the inside diameter, the gunpowder had more time to burn behind the ball, generate more gases and thus speed up the uh, exit velocity. So, um, so what's interesting is finally around 1450, uh, we have, sorry. Um, sorry, one second. Finally, about four, you know, 1450, we have Dutch that basically developed um, gun makers added the long logs to um, either side of the cannon barrel. We don't see logs here. I mean, we can see logs here, but they also added wheels. Um, so what's interesting is the, the logs will let, you, let the, um, you know, the, the cannon to move up and down. Therefore, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, it has, um, it, it could be hauled uh, to the battlefield, you know, by horses through the wheel. And since it could go up and down, it has more of the range. Sorry. A quick comment. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, back to the corning and then this reinforcement of the, the barrels. So what the corning is, is just changes the particle size. It's like sugar. If you take a sugar cube and you drop it in water, it doesn't dissolve well. But if you crush it and you put it in there, it dissolves very quickly. The more surface area you have when you crush and make smaller particles, the faster they react. And so the original gunpowder with the small particles reacted very fast and half the time it blew apart any barrel because you got this immediate explosion and the corning and some of these other processes basically slowed that chemical reaction down so that if the reaction happens as the projectile is going out the, you know, the tube and you can accelerate it rather than just blow apart the tube. So, and then the other way is to, to make tubes, strengthen the tube, which is what you were just showing, that, you know, they cast thicker tubes. Correct. Correct. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, anybody else have any questions or any, anything? <clears throat> So uh, as both corn powder and cannon barrels improved, now we have, we have to have uh, denser ammunition, right? So, so you improve, improve two, two parts of the you know, important uh, areas. Now let's have a you know, denser ammunition. Uh, the cannonballs were stone, in, stone initially, right? Initially they used stone, but those were expensive to carve and they tended to shatter when they hit uh, castle walls. So the, you know, um, they would throw a, a stone and it shatters and doesn't really cause any, any damage. To take advantage of other improvements in the system, artillery officers, officers sought out iron balls that could be cast more cheaply because they could be cast more precisely. Iron cannon balls could be made so that they uh, were a small clearance between the ball and the bore of the gun meaning that the ball captured more of the power of the explosive. Uh, that's basically what happened. So the overall system improvements were corn powder, you know, iron cannon, and then, you know, obviously uh, iron uh, cannonballs. 
which defined uh, European armies from 1600 to 1900 for 300 years. The only real change uh, in 19th century uh, were the new chemical explosives TNT, otherwise the concept was the same. Um, so what's interesting is some of the uh, army generals also, also tried to learn uh, trigonometry um, in order to you know, find out the, how to aim this particular um, cannons to, uh, for a distance and velocity of it um, and stuff like that. So now in France, the king, um, in king established 17th century artillery, artillery corps. So now we have uh, a people studying this particular uh, art. Um, and the first school in France called Ecole des Ponts and Chaussée, uh, which was actually called school, school for Bridges and Roads, developed first engineering corps uh, that would you know, um, service and use uh, this, you know, the cannons in 17th century. So that's how long it took for an actual school of artillery developed in, Fran in France, all right? And it's also uh, caused, um, like right now, if you look at the United States Army, they have a civil engineering corps that's actually under the American federal government that actually uh, belongs to the US Army Corps engineers. Okay, so now as gunpowder and cannons were very expensive right at the time, only kings could afford such things. So that's why we see a monarchy um, developing really well in 1600 and 1700. So whenever there was a rebellious town, the kings would come in with cannons and just you know shoot up the whole town. And they are uh, you you know you you're talking about French kings, the Sun King Louis the Fourteenth, and all this incredible you know, monarchy up until the Marie Antoinette, which was happened uh, in the 18th century, uh, monarchy was really you know, prospering. Uh, so now, <clears throat> anybody has any questions or want to add anything? So now I just wanted to talk about what type of guns they had. Um, so initially, uh, so there was, uh, the reason we call this guns as um, uh, the phrase lock, stock, and barrel is because for those three factors, that they're lock, stock, and barrel, right? The first one uh, initially obviously was without a handle. If you're looking at particularly a stock. Um, so uh, the stock was first part of the form. I'm gonna admit somebody, one second. Uh, the stock was first part of the forum. To begin a wooden, wooden stick inserted into the socket at the back end of the barrel, which the soldier could then grip, okay? Over time, so initially it was without the handle, the stock. Over time, the stock evolved in a wooden piece that allowed the soldier to hold the gun up to his shoulder so they could be absorbed the recoil with a whole torso, as opposed to simply, uh, uh, simply his arms. So he would basically, um, that's for protection of the soldier. So now we talk about a lock, right? Let's go to the next picture. Um, whoops. So um, this is uh, actually a, a different picture, but I will talk about the lock was probably the most complicated piece to develop, uh, and there's different kinds of locks, as we know. Edit had delivered the ignition change to the gun ignition um, charge to the gun power. So the lock has to de deliver the ignition charge to the gun power. Early soldiers often wished they had three hands, two to hold the gun, and a third to apply the match to the charge. Okay. A first step came in the form of a small hook attached to liver, lever. And the hook was placed at a smoldering wick, and when a soldier pulled in um, an, um, a lever, uh, the beginning of the trigger, the wick swung down and ignited the gunpowder through the uh, patch hole in the barrel, known as a matchlock. This was a cutting edge uh, handgun from the middle of 1400s to the early 1500s. 
the mechanism was called a lock because the next, uh, you know, the next nearest everyday thing that it resembled was the, um, you know, lock found on the doors. So now what we're looking at here is, is a will lock, right? Uh, Zach? Yeah, go ahead. Just a couple. Before they developed this mechanism, which is a sense of trigger mechanism, there was an earlier form of gun called an arquebus. And an arquebus didn't have any, tra any such uh, trigger mechanism. So as you say, you needed three hands to hold it. You need two hands to hold the gun and one to touch the match, which was the elute, which was the smoldering rope to the, to the gunpowder in the flash pan, um, okay. which meant an arquebus needed a, basically you had to shoot an arquebus with a, from a platform or say if you had a fence or you, you had a stick supporting the front end of the gun or you could put it on a railing or a fence then you could fire it but you couldn't just have it as a handheld shoulder weapon because that required two hands and then you couldn't light it so you needed so it was pretty limited as an infantry weapon you couldn't it wasn't really movable uh it wasn't simply portable so by having a trigger then you could do it with two hands you could have one hand holding the back and pulling the trigger and then it became a truly portable uh, infantry weapon. Thanks. Right. So, um, oh, sorry. I'm going to admit somebody. Sorry, guys. So, um, Leonardo da Vinci was actually doing his sketches in, you know, early 1500s. And um, I'll show you his sketch. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. This is a bad, bad copy of the sketch. But eventually, it's a sketch of a will lock of by Leonardo da Vinci. And, 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 and sorry, uh, Amal, can you can you mute yourself? Sorry. All right. So I think you're you're here twice. <laughs> All right. Yes. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So basically. Um, uh, he had an early version of this will lock. Uh, and, the, you know, uh, basically it was an alternative to the match lock. Instead of dealing with a smoldering wick, Leonardo developed the will lock, which is what I'm, you know, talking about. Much like a modern cigarette lighter, right? When you have a cigarette lighter and, uh, you know, you, you turn on the wheel, the device consists of steel wheel, which when rotated struck a flint, giving off the spark that went through the thatch hole. Okay, so it basically is struck, you know, uh, and uh, struck the flint and giving off the spark and then it went off to the touch hole. So the German gun makers enthusiastically adopted the wheel lock and used it initially to make a hunting guns for an ability since the wheel lock was uh, too delicate um, and too expensive to be placed in the ordinary soldier's hands. Eventually in 18th century, the wheel lock on a sh you know, shoulder guns were replaced by the flintlock, which I'll get to that now. Can I make a quick comment? You were mentioning Da Vinci? Yes. Yeah, part of one of his jobs was actually to calculate the trajectories of cannons. But one of the things about gunpowder, there's a lot of things, developments in mathematics that in some ways come out of gunpowder. And uh, Galileo's, some of his earliest studies, that's one of the things he was the first person to realize what the trajectory is from a cannon. And there's been many, many famous mathematicians who have worked on cannonball trajectories. And even to the modern times, uh, some of the early computers were actually devices to calculate the trajectory of you know, guns and ballistics. There's a nice, there's a beautiful uh, picture somewhere I've seen of da Vinci's that shows it's a wall, castle wall or something with like 10,000 different trajectories, uh, a drawing of it, showing a cannon firing with all these different possible trajectories. So just an aside on Da Vinci. Yeah, definitely we'll check it out. But also the interesting fact is, you know, he was quite a character. I mean, uh, we obviously know about, you know, uh, Mona Lisa and, uh, you know, he also, you know, writing and he was also, uh, as I've heard, a physician and he was also a gun maker. I mean, how many, <laughs> how, 
how many trades do you need to possess to be, a, you know, uh, at that time? Uh, this is this this is unheard of. And all of them, he was, he was, you know, uh, perf- you know, perfect or close to perfect, uh, you know, masterpieces everywhere. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, so the guy was a visionary, almost like uh, you know Elon Musk of today's time, I guess. I don't know. So now, um, you know, and thanks for the addition, Jerry. I appreciate it. So eventually in 18th century, the wheel lock on the shoulder guns was replaced by a flint lock, which is what I'm showing, in which a trigger controlled by a hammer-like lever, lever that had a flint mounted on it. And that flint stuck a steel piece that was mounted next to the touch hole. Wheel lock through a gaze rise to the first pistol favored by cavalrymen since they can ride and shoot. Um, that's basically all I have. This is a short presentation. Sorry, guys. If you have any questions or want to add anything or Jerry, uh, Ralph, um, and basically, you know, guns was an invention that, you know, shaped um, both Europe, China, and, um, you know, Middle East uh, in China. Um, you have a Ming dynasty that throw, you know, throughout Mongols. In Europe, you have a hundred year war, Jean d'Arc using, you know, cannons. Um, and you, and all later in 16, you know, 1600s, 1700s, you have, um, you know, uh, you would say czars, you know, emperors, kings that, you know, basically are used uh, cannons to, um, uh, to make a political statement uh, and to stay at the helm. So any questions, anything you wanted to add, or this is more like a discussion today. Um, and I had a, a couple of just comments and things that, because I had read over some things ahead of time, because I thought this was really interesting. Thank you. Um, one of the things that interests me, because I'm into science things, but Lavoisier, who was a discoverer basically of oxygen and the process of, of burning, um, the French had a major problem during the 18th century of getting gunpowder. And somebody had mentioned some other ways that they do it, you know, using dung and other things. But they sent, uh, Lavoisier was the head of this commission to try to find other sources or better ways of making gunpowder because that was part of their, you know, their military limitations were just finding gunpowder. There were no natural sources available to France. And uh, so anyway, he came up with lots of schemes for making it more effective. And since he was a friend of Franklin's, one of the problems that the, uh, during the American Revolution, they couldn't get the British blockaded, you know, any gunpowder imports and all the gunpowder before that had come from England. And uh, so um, since Franklin was a friend of uh, a colleague of Lavoisier, the two of them, there are a lot of letters back and forth about how you can find other sources of gunpowder. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I just thought it was an interesting thing there. And uh, there are actually several uh, gunpowder manufacturers that were paid by the, uh, the Americans to come to the United States and help produce gunpowder during the revolution, you know, for the, for the Americans. An aside, other, two other things that I don't know about you, but uh, I'm old enough. In the old days when I was in college, they used the sodium uh, nitrate. Everybody said saltpeter was an anaphrodisiac. It stopped any sexual urges. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard that. <laughs> okay. No. No. And I always Did wondered. It work? It was... <laughs> now they use helium. Now they use helium. <laughs> yeah. There's any a all-male <laughs> schools, they always, there was always the rumor that they put it in the food and in the cafeterias. <laughs> Uh, Did it work? No, apparently this is, this is no truth to it, but everybody believed it. <laughs> uh, awesome. And then the other thing is, it turns out that, um, you know, they use sodium nitrite like uh, in hot dogs and things like that. But the sodium nitrate, which is gunpowder, was actually used for a thousand years to preserve food and apparently still in salami. If you buy salami or... Um, I think corned beef still uses it. So what, if you have a corned beef sandwich the next time you're, 
imbibing a little bit of uh, gunpowder. Interesting, interesting. Wow. So yeah, I mean, um, I appreciate, um, you know, anybody else have any questions or? Yeah, um, Zach, could you go back a few, a few comments on the, um, well, particularly the match lock versus the flint lock. Could you go back sure. a couple of them to that uh, one with the wooden stock and the sure, sure, sure. thicker barrel? One second. You just told me when to stop. Yeah, I know. I'll go back. A couple more. Another one. That one. That this one here. Yeah. This is a this is a primitive match lock. That white spiral thing was a burning or smoldering cord, and you can see just below it there's a hole, which is the touch hole in the barrel, and that lever going down is sort of a crude trigger. So you could hold the um, the stock of the gun and pull and bring up that lever and the match would go down, that smoldering cord would go down, ignite the powder in the touch hole. Um, now, in order to load it, you not only had to load the charge of gunpowder down the barrel, um, but then you had to add some other primer into the touch hole, then you could ignite the touch hole. Now, of course, the main disadvantage of the match lock is it wouldn't work in the rain. If, uh, if you had a battle and it was raining at the time, well, the match would get put out and the powder would get damp and the thing just wouldn't fire. Um, and likewise, you couldn't carry it for a long time and then have it ready to fire because you'd have to, the match would burn or would have to be adjusted. Okay, advance a couple to the flint lock. Sure. Uh, next, yeah, that one, that one there. So the flint, by having a flint on steel, you didn't need a burning thing, and it wouldn't be affected by the weather. You didn't have you didn't have a, a, a burning cord that had to be adjusted all the time. The flint would just hit the, the metal, um, set off the spark, ignite. Um, thing. Now at this point, you needed the flash pan, the primer powder was put into the flash pan, which went down through the touch hole into the charge in the barrel. And the frizzen, uh, when it wasn't in use, the frizzen would cover up the flash pan. So you could put the primer into the flash pan, cover it with the frizzen. And then when you pulled the trigger, the spring loaded tr uh, trigger, the flint would go down, push the frizzen off of the flash pan, hit the steel, ignite the powder. So this meant it was weatherproof and it could be and pr it protected against the rain and pretty much weatherproof and could be set up and then carried for, for an hour or so. And then when, it, when you wanted to shoot, it, it was ready to shoot. Um, one other comment on, uh, uh, just a correction on Jerry. Of course, potat well, the comment on potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate was the main ingredient of gunpowder, but of course, potassium nitrate is by itself not really explosive. You need something to, you need the sulfur and the carbon to make gunpowder. You need them, uh, as, as uh, uh, Zach said, you need them ground together. Um, so yeah, potassium nitrate is a preservative, but potassium nitrate yeah. itself yeah. cannot be used as, as gunpowder. Now, so uh, in America, as you say, in, it was very difficult to get potassium nitrate in temperate countries. It tended to be uh, produced in the tropics naturally, and you could find deposits of it there. So um, I think a major source of gunpowder, particularly for America and major, maybe for Europe, was from South America, where they had large deposits of bird guano. And those were very rich in potassium nitrate. So they could import, and this was a huge uh, import from Chile in, in particular, was this potassium, or this uh, bird guano, which was very rich in potassium nitrate. So that could be brought in, that would, and then that could be purified into potassium nitrate. And then in America, then it could be combined. Uh, carbon, of course, charcoal and sulfur, charcoal's totally available anywhere and, and sulfur is pretty readily available. So it was the potassium nitrate. So you could find, import the potassium nitrate 
then you could mix it and blend it with the carbon and sulfur to give you your gunpowder. Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, we have just James joined. Uh, James, anything you want to add uh, as far as the, uh, I guess we can just go through our slides since, you know, um, yeah. James just joined and, uh, go ahead, James, sorry. No, I, I'm sorry to be late because I, sorry. Some uh, real yeah. work. <laughs> now, now you owe me a presentation, but we'll just go over, summarize everything. So we were talking about, um, uh the combination of uh, what creates um you know the gunpowder and um and particularly uh there's a combination here i think was 15 percent charcoal 10 percent salt for 70 percent saltpeter then we spoke about what the alternative to saltpeter and saltpeter alternative that was you know developed or pe people didn't come out with anything better but it was a human urine of an alcoholic that creates an ammonium. <laughs> so, um, you know, we talked about how Chinese has weaponized and the first weapon that was used to then kick out the, you know, uh, uh, Mongols out of China. Um, and also they actually used this weapon to defend themselves against um, outer Mongolia, Tibet, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and Ch you know, Chinese, as we know, in Tibet, it was um, uh, Uyghur Kaganat that was developing and uh, seems like they still have problems. But at the time it was as big as China, the uh, Turkey Kaganat. Um, this was the, um, the person with his wife, Ma uh, Zhang, who became an emperor um, of Ming Dynasty. And Ming Dynasty actually ruled for 300 years in China, which is interesting. And they kicked out, um, kicked out Mongols. This was the uh, first, uh, you couldn't think of it, looks like uh, this This one, the first one was used shells uh, by Chinese uh, using the gunpowder. Uh, and this was the first lance that was used by Chinese. And this is depiction. Um, this is the first cannon and from China. It's very small, but um, and like the European where they need to use it to break the walls and the fortification of the towns or the sink the ship. Um, how did it get to Europe? It got, you know, we don't really know exactly, but I think we, it got through Silk Road, you know, uh, or maybe one Mongol invasion of Russia and uh, Eastern, um, uh, Eastern U Europe. And uh, as we know, um, uh, the son of um, Genghis Khan and Greg, correct me, I think it's Subite, was in, in Poland, um, attacking Poland, uh, and would have probably decimated because he just beat in Hungary King Bela with his um, amazing. Um, uh, Sobatai was a general who right. uh, uh, was working with the grandson of uh, Chinggis Khan, Batu Khan, uh, right. but he was the, uh, really the genius behind the whole campaign. Yes but they did attack Poland and Hungary. And then yeah. there's, a, there's actually an interesting story about it. And up until today in Poland, uh, they have bells in, um, in Warsaw um, ringing every day. And it's not against Nazi attacking, it's against, uh, it's to warn people to escape because the Mongols are attacking. We're talking about 13th century, it's 700 years, 800 years later, and Polish still scared of um, Mongols and not as much as, you know, they're scared of Nazis who literally took over Poland in two weeks, but Mongols did a number of them at the time. And uh, uh, so that's the Subitai apparently brought the technology in here, maybe Arabs brought it in. And the first account of it was, you know, um, you know Bishop Bacon, um, as I've mentioned, talking to Pope, and he said, by the flash of the combustion of the fires and by the honors of the sounds, wonders can be uh, wrought and at any distance that we wish so that the man can hardly protect himself or endure it. So this was an acquisition of calm power in the um, late uh, 1200s, 1287, I believe. Uh, then this was the first cannons that were developed. 
the Dutch developed the will and the log that would hold the um, you know uh, uh, the cannon, uh, and also the fact the log would let the cannon go up and down. So this was you know obviously better fortified, and in in fact uh, a lot of armies you know generals used uh, trigonometry to aim it correctly uh, based on this technology for velocity and distance. Um, European uses, you know, fortifying the towns. We talked about Constantinople, Mehmed II, um, you know, uh, using the uh, three cannons. One of them, I think, believe was called Safia, developed by a Hungarian, uh, you know, uh, uh, craft make, craftsmaker who sold it to Mehmed. Might as well could have sold it to um, who was the uh, uh, emperor of Byzantium at the time. I think it was Constantine. 11th or 12th, I don't remember. Um, and uh, firearms, this was the first, uh, not the first, I mean, it's one of the earliest version of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, handgun or not handgun, but, you know, kind of like not rifle, but handgun. But what's interesting, the rifle was developed more for accuracy because of the fact that within the rifle, uh, they have a technology that uh, bounces off the bullet um, like all over the place so that it aims correctly. Uh, this is, as uh, uh, Ralph had mentioned, you can see a stick holding a first uh, musket. Um, now, yeah, uh, uh, they were they weighed about twenty five pounds or more, and this is a stick that holds it. And you, you know, you literally need you know three hands to do it. Right there. Sorry, I'm gonna show right here. Um, so yeah, that's called an arquebus. Arquebus, yeah, sorry, Arquebus, yeah. Arquebus actually is coming from the German word, and I'll tell you the German word. Sorry, I missed that one, that part. Um, the German word was, start with H, uh, Heckenbacher. Uh, so the English word for Heck, Heckenbacher was Arquebus. It was actually a German word in 15th cent, 14th century. Um, so, uh, this is the depiction from Leonardo da Vinci of the uh, wheelbarrow that he developed. I'm sorry for a bad picture. Um, this is a wheelbarrow that was developed, then flint barrel. Uh, you know, we're just talking about different firearms, match lock, wheel lock, flint lock. Uh, first recorded in 1364, 1400 match lock guns, first mechanically firing guns. Wicks were not attached to the clamp that sprang into the gun power. 59 wheel lock guns, wicks were replaced by the wheel that generally sparked for ignition and gunpowder, but it was not used up until the 18th century, the wheel lock, because it, it wasn't considered the flint lock. Um, flint lock guns uh, the, uh, did two things mechanically, open the lid for the flash pan and provide an igniting spark. Okay. Uh, this is how the 17th century battlefield looks um, and that basically you have a lot of cannons, um, you have fortification, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, basically, and then that, uh, around in France, they developed the first uh, auto, uh, you know, artillery school for artillery corp course. And I've mentioned that one already. And, um, you know, up until 1863, when they developed, uh, you know, the dynamite from the uh, uh, nitroglycerin you know, this is basically, we've, we've had the uh, gunpowder, you know, up until that time. So from 1300s all the way to 1863 uh, and somewhat. That's it. Any uh, just a, a comment on this last one. Yeah, dynamite, of course, replaced gunpowder as an explosive, but the gunpowder, which is now called black powder, it's the same thing, was replaced by what's called smokeless powder, which was nitrocellulose. So I don't think dynamite or nit uh, uh, I don't think dynamite was used as a gunpowder. I think it was the smokeless powder, which was nitrocellulose, which was used for guns, replacing the black powder. One of the advantages of the nitrocellulose, it was more powerful and it burned much cleaner. With gunpowder, you'd get residues of the carbon. And, and the black powder, and you'd need to clean the barrel of the gun, I think more or less after every shot, or at least after every few shots, whereas with the smokeless powder, you could fire 
shot after shot after shot. Well, yeah, I mean, it would take you, it took almost a minute to reload the muzzle loader, to clean the barrel and reload the muzzle loader, put in the primer and so on. So it was, it was slow firing. And at the, so initially it wasn't a great advantage over, a, over an, an archer, because an archer could fire 10 arrows a minute, whereas a, an early uh, gunman, an infantryman could fire one, one ball per minute. Okay, thanks. Thank you, I appreciate it. Any, any questions, uh, J James, late arrival, or anybody has any, any additions? Any discussions? This is more discussions on Thursday, uh, not really a, a full-fledged presentation. And we're never having a lecture here. This is more for us to ask as many questions, as many additions. So have, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for everybody. I mean, does anybody know, I mean, what's the big difference with the guns today? What is the great improvement of the guns today? Do they come from this school or they are totally different things? The automatic, um, I, whatever. I, I could answer that. One of the big improvements after these guns was the introducing of rifling, which is a spiral that's etched into the rifle barrel and then uses con use cylindrical or conical, bu cylindrical bullets with a conical head. So the rifling would give a spin to the bullet and the... Um, the conical, sh the shape of a cylinder with a pointed end would, uh, the spinning would make them much more accurate uh, as opposed to a sphere which tumbles. And it also gives you more impact. You have more weight in a narrower, a narrow frontal area. So it travels further and it's much more accurate. So the invention of rifling was a big step forward. Another one was breech loading. All of the guns we've talked about here are muzzle loading. And you have to, after you shoot, you have to clean out the barrel. Then you have to put down, you put in the charge, the gunpowder charge. Then you put in a paper wad to hold the gunpowder in place. Then you put in the bullet. Uh, and often I think you need another paper char, another paper wad on top of that. So the bullet doesn't roll out the barrel if you're firing down. Everything has to be packed in there. With a breech loading thing and you get a cartridge, you just open up the, the back of the gun, the base of the barrel, put in a new bullet, close it, fire it, eject that, put in a new one, fire, load, uh, close it and fire it. And you just get a much more rapid rate of fire. So a breech loading um, rifle is much longer range, much more accurate and much faster to reload and then with the smokeless powder, with the replacement of gunpowder by smokeless powder, you get, you, that also increases the range, the velocity and the range. Thanks. And I, I just wanted to add that uh, this rifle uh, invention, uh, it was actually uh, uh, very successfully used uh, by British in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and that's one of the advantage they had because French didn't have it yet. Uh, they were they were just uh, they paid attention to it because of the longer range and and uh, accuracy uh, when they realized I, I was just reading uh, it was successfully used in Spain uh, where uh, Wellington uh, uh, you know were re uh, repelling uh, French occupation um, so uh, just as you were saying it just remembered I was reading about this. Uh, very interesting, but French eventually paid attention to it and, and, and started to develop their own, but uh, they mostly used muskets at the time. Uh, yeah, I guess in, in America, I guess the revolution, there was all muzzle loading muskets. And yeah. by the time of the Civil War, it was breech loading rifles. I have a, an, another comment and partly question. Uh, something that's changed since these weapons is the cost. Uh, I mean, now you can 3D print a gun for essentially you know, $20 or $10 or so, you know, an hour's labor cost or less. And I'm just wondering, the cavalry, for example, uh, you know, people who brought horses into battle in the past, they had to be moderately wealthy and they had to 
provide their own horses. So I'm just wondering on some of these early uh, guns that use gunpowder, did the individuals, was the cost of something like that? I mean, some of these are beautiful. Uh, you know, that may just be for special purposes, but I'm just wondering what the cost was and whether it would have been possible to arm large numbers of people. Uh, does anybody have any ideas on that? From what I know, uh, the, 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 the regular army is already developed, especially when you, you're talking about uh, 18th century. And uh, uh, no, the individuals wouldn't bear the cost. It was provided by the government and the mass produced and provided by the government. Not, not unlike like in medieval times where you have to bear the cost. I was thinking more like in the 18th century, like at the... Yeah, you know, I'm the talking time about of the, the same, they were mass produced. They were already mass produced and uh, uh, provided by, by, by the government. For sure, the British uh, uh, didn't have to do this uh, in the 18th century. Uh, at least uh, uh, by the time of these, uh, I, I don't know in the United States um, how they managed. They, they, uh, I, I don't think they, they had mass production. I think they were buying guns from France or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I, I don't think at that point it was like individual. Well, American army wasn't as organized, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was just forming, you know, here and there, I'm not sure, but British for sure, uh, they, the government provided. Well, Kamau had a question, when were the first cartridges used? And I just read up on it, it says that uh, it was actually developed in 1860 by Smith and Wesson. Uh, among, among other things, a revolver handgun that used metal cartilage, help establish cartilage farms at a standard in the US late 1860. So that's the answer. <laughs> um, um, to yeah. go, back, to go, go back to Greg's, the other question and, and Greg's comment. Um, I think in America, in the Revolutionary War, basically everybody had a gun. People had guns for, for hunting, if not for any other reason. So back in the colonial era, everybody had a gun. And for the Revolution, basically the militia, people were just called up as militias to fight the, the, red, the British Redcoats. And I think pretty yeah. much everybody brought their gun with them. Yeah, in 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 uh, yeah, in America, I can I, I can see that because they didn't have a regular army, <laughs> you know. But in British, uh, it was well organized, and uh, uh, the the soldiers didn't uh, you know didn't bear the cost of the army. You 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 buy. I I, I remember uh, you could you could buy a, a uh, an officer rank, but not not uh, the uh, because of the weapons, but it's uh, uh, you could buy a commission. Uh, as an officer, but as a soldier, uh, you have nothing. <laughs> and I think in America, back then, sort of a gunsmith was a very skilled artisan, and each yeah. gun was assembled in an artisanal manner and just fitted together. It was Eli Whitney, who famous, who also invented the cotton gin, who at around 1800 event, invented a gun factory with replaceable parts. So you could make a thousand triggers and a thousand barrels mm -hmm. and a thousand of each of the components and then just assemble them from these components. Whereas prior to that, everything, it, all pieces had to be individually fitted together and filed and smoothed and done. Whereas he, he invented this mass production of interchangeable parts where you could just have a whole bunch of parts and you could just assemble gun after gun after gun in an assembly line. Thanks. So, and, okay. Okay. And, uh, well, it just just one more thought came out because we're talking about history here. Uh, and we ma mentioned the cartridges, and I just recall, um, I forgot, do you remember there was a rebellion in India? It was yeah. a rebellion of the, um, the how you call them? Sipai. Because, Sipai, right? I, Sipai. how you said? Sipai. Yeah, yeah. The sepoys. Yeah, sepoys, yeah. Because they were, uh, it all had to do with those cartridges because they were Muslims and they were assured that the fat was used, uh, it was beef fat or, or it's lamb fat. But then they found out there was a pig fat and then you have to bite it, you know, to open it. So 
uh, they were outraged and it was a very serious rebellion. And uh, it was, uh, the British, they, they really killed a lot of people, a lot of civilians as well. And the British had the hard time putting it down. It took uh, like a few years. Uh, so that's, the Carter just reminded me this, but that was in 19th century, of course, uh, later on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it did, it did change the politics um, and the, the way that technology was used for defenses and the strategies had changed significantly. So, um, you know, just to end this, this weekend, we have two presentations. Uh, on Saturday, we're talking about American Cop, if anybody's interested in uh, parasailing or sailing at um, 12. And then on Sunday at 4, we have a history of Nubia. We're going to Africa now. And um, we do want to talk about particularly two cultures, you know, um, or two cities uh, compared to cultures, Meroya and Nabata, which is a Nubian kingdom and particularly Nubian, um, Nubian uh, kings uh, being pharaohs in Egypt, which would be interesting if you, if you, guys, you guys want to join um that's basically it i want to wish everybody a nice evening and uh i will see you saturday or sunday whenever you guys join uh thank you thank you sir thank you okay thanks, thanks. very good good discussion thank you yep. bye